Hey, welcome ladies and gentlemen. Welcome out there in internet land. This is your old friend Charlie Hunter with the Reasonably Fine Art Talk. And what a fine art talk we have for you today, ladies and gentlemen. Coming to you from the Steel City where they make Iron City beer and Iron Willed Men and Iron Willed Women and Iron Willed Non-Binary People too. But our special guest today, one of my absolute favorite painters, a man who is truly fearless when it comes to tackling uh, smearing paint around on a surface, my good friend, friend Patrick Lee. Welcome, Patrick. Thank you. Thanks, Charlie. Glad to be here. Now, you're in your studio. Your studio yes. looks capacious. Capacious would seem to be the word for your it studio. Is, yeah. At least vertically yeah. capacious. Yeah, it's got like 15 foot ceilings and I have track lighting and uh, like natural daylight fluorescence and I have windows over here to like north facing windows, a few of them. They're not really that usable. I don't use them that much, but yeah, it's a nice space. Yeah, it looks yeah. it. And you, we were just chatting backstage and uh, you, have, you have supported yourself for the last number of years yeah. primarily as a as a teacher at a college and you're not doing yeah. that this year no no because that's kind of flip now that's kind of I, i've been slowly weaning off of that i stopped doing summer classes and then i was down to like two classes a semester and then this semester i just thought it just seemed like the right time with the covid and all that and, and, and not doing the online stuff and just it seemed right and i'm just working harder now than i ever have and i just love it so we just which is saying something. Uh oh, Beth Brownlee Bates says, Oh no, Patrick. I don't know if that's a negative or a positive. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Hi, Beth. Anyway, Hi. Um, it, 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 for those of you who may not be familiar with Patrick's work, let's take a look at a couple of things that you do and then we'll we'll get down into, into some nitty gritty. Miss Betty Sue is behind the scenes here and putting up putting up the slides. Miss Betty Sue, could we have that first slide of the no tan? One of the things I am utterly enamored of that you do, Patrick, are these no tan life drawing sketches. Can you talk a little about how you started with this uh, practice? And I believe it is it acrylic ink. Um, it, or is well, it, it's, it just it's just black acrylic paint, and sometimes I'll use white acrylic. But it's like on it's on that Strathmore 400 series drawing paper that's kind of a buff color, so the white paint actually shows up on it. You can actually see the whiteness of it. It's a little higher value. But ideally, with the best ones, I only use the black. I I don't put the white on. And when the white goes on, it kind of ruins it. Um, but as far as when I started doing these. I think it was like 2015. It was it was right after Wayne. I think it was right after Wayne Planner or something. I got I kind of had the idea there when I got home. I started doing these uh, just kind of improvised knife paintings. These are all palette knife too. So I, oh, really? I draw, yeah, yeah, they're all they're they're 99 percent palette knife. Some of them might have brushes on the little features on the face or something, but usually it's just like a little dot with a palette knife for the eye or the shadow on the nose or whatever. But um, so, so I really wanted to limit myself, my ability to have finesse with the tool. It's like one of those four inch, it's like this palette knife right here, this size. Whoa. And that, yeah, like, like three inch or whatever that is. And then these are probably like eight by eight or eight by 10 squares. So the rectangles. And so um, I started doing these, imagine just drawings with them, just kind of like, almost like Rorschach. <laughs> blots you know um but then i went took them to life i'm like i'm going to try this setup at the life drawing session and the first couple i did were just awful people were walking up and saying what are you doing here you know what is this and i and i and i saved all that stuff but actually the first really good one i got um actually nancy tankersley has that one in her house she she bought that at a show i did down at south street before they closed and she got that one. i told her that was the first one that actually worked and from that point i did you know hundreds of these other ones i figured out with hers how to do it after many errors with it and i was able to get some of these other ones but this has been this has kind of been the root of what i've been trying to do for a couple of years now i'm trying to figure out how to make these 
work. It's like a puzzle I've been trying to figure out for the last, I'd say, four years or so. Well, um, you, you, when I look at this, so this is still an active part of your practice? Yeah, trying to figure out how these things turn into larger paintings and how to compose these things into larger pieces. It, it's a strange thing. It seems like it'd be very straight ahead and, and easy, but it's not, at least not for me. It doesn't, right. it, it, it doesn't have a straight ahead approach. Like if I took any one of those things, images, you see them just tried to blow it up into painting, which I have, um, it, do, it, 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 it doesn't really work the way you think it would. And I even got large, like, you know, I have them over there, but like, big cement trowels, you know, like floats for putting, for leveling concrete, like to kind of get big gobs of paint and, and slide them on there. Cause I thought, well, maybe I'm not applying it with a big enough tool on there to, to spread the paint, but it still doesn't look. There's something I'm trying to figure out. There's something missing. I think I'm starting to get there with it. We'll yeah, I, 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 I understand exactly what, I think I understand exactly what you mean. Cause I've, I've had that time, that, occurrence where I've taken a detail of a painting that seemed to me really dynamic, very small, and yeah. I have literally taken a photograph of it, projected it, and then trying to use big tools to keep that spontaneity, you know, just put the lights and darks where they were, yeah. much, much like this, and it does not necessarily it, translate. Yeah, something, something happens in that translation that doesn't... Yeah. It doesn't work. And and so I'm trying to figure that out. I'm trying to figure out how to make that work. And of course, you see, like, you know, I go to the Carnegie here and we have a really beautiful uh, Franz Klein. And, you know, he, you know, as I understand, he would do little studies and things like that and turn those and turn those in. But it looks like he's using like a mop, you know, like literally a four mop. Dip. And when you look at the mark making on those, they're, they're enormous paintings, you know. Uh, yeah. but, I, but I see that. And I'm like, well, this guy figured that out, you know. 60 years ago or whatever, 70 years, whatever. And, you know, I don't want to copy that. And so I'm still trying to figure out other things. You know, obviously I want some of this stuff to be representational, but also I also kind of like moving down that path where a lot of stuff is left. Yes. Maybe not so much representational, maybe very open to interpretation. Right. At least Spitting, a lot of the- Creating right on the edge of representationalism and noise. Right. Yeah. So it's like, you know, right on that knife edge. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And trying to do that and trying to also understand space. I've been reading, I don't know if you ever saw that. Um, oh, Eric Earl or whatever his name. I can't remember his name, but he wrote a book called Cezanne's Composition and understanding how Cezanne conceived of space and conceived of space as a very shallow kind of plastic environment um, right. with planes that step back. And it was just the first time I tried to read this book years ago, it was very confusing. I didn't really understand it. But after years of studying and looking at paintings and copying and doing that and trying to read about him and learn about him, I'm trying to, you know, I'm starting to understand that book and how he opened a whole can of worms right. with spatial, <laughs> with the malleability of space and the plastic quality of pulling the background. In other words, re recreating the reality that's out there in his format of his painting, taking reality and recreating it, not just, not just transcribing what's out there, but making a translation in the syntax of paint and line and color and making a new thing. So that's kind of the fact right. that space is malleable, time is an element of space. And so you can have these multiple spatial views in one painting, these multiple time stamps or time eras in one painting, you know, uh, that you can move in and out. I don't, I, don't, I don't know if you saw the new Charlie Kaufman movie. The Netflix no, not, movie. no uh, that's called. It's called I'm Thinking of Ending Things, and it's absolutely, I don't know if you like if you like his movies, but it's absolutely fantastic. And I think oh, this yeah. movie bears multiple viewings. I saw it once, and then I watched a couple sections twice, but it has that kind of dreamlike spatial and time malleability where like in a dream you could be in one room and then walk into another room. I had a dream I was in this room and then I walked into this room that was like a kitchen and all my little nephews who were little kids at the time were grown men and I recognized them. And so oh, there's Brandon in there, you know, and I, and I was like, what is going on? You know, and this was years and years ago when they were still kids, you know, um, or there were figures that I knew were them. I just, you know, you just know things in the dream. So that, so approaching that kind of thing with a painting is what I ultimately 
want to want to try to do at some point. I really the things I've done up to this point are kind of like I can live with some of them, but most of it I really I can't stand a lot of it. You know what I mean? Like it's it just seems like yeah, it just seems like it's kind of like I'm faking it or like it's not the real deal or something. You know? Right. So, right. Well, yeah. you're one of you're one of the most unforgiving and rigorous of. Uh, the, our, of our compatriots, uh, which is something yeah. I really respect. Why don't we move on to the next slide, Betty? Okay, yeah. Um, because one of the things that I, what I like doing whenever I'm at a plein air event with you is is flipping the bird at, mm. because yeah. you take, you you are willing to trust the viewer to build what isn't there. Yeah. I mean, the story you're telling isn't necessarily the story of the exact thing that we're looking at. You know, that's what right. I really respect about you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And, and, yeah. And, and looking at your note hands, doing all those endless little compositions, it so informs ourselves as we're working on paintings when we're to be aware of the positive and negative spaces. What you're doing in this one, this glimpse, um, is is you know you 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 have those these the two big, the light world and the dark world, and then you just fracture it up, and yeah. so you're, you're not telling a literal story, but you are telling a a an atmospheric story. So talk about this one a little bit. Yeah, that's. And thank you for saying that because that's one of the things that I um, another thing I'm trying to approach rather than like I would rather do a I would rather do a half-assed painting that had some of that I could build in some of that initial feeling I had about the scene that was maybe kind of the drawing was off or whatever but it had a feeling of the place it's like groupie said about uh, he he said uh, mall hop did these or there was another painter, I can't remember, but he did these great paintings that were very slick. And he said, but Mulhoff, he wasn't as good as a draftsman, but you could, he said you could smell the, the fish and the air in his paintings, you know, of, of the shore of Rockport or Gloucester or wherever. And so um, getting that feeling, that's one of the reasons, I, I didn't really dwell on the title of this or anything, Glimpse, but it was the idea of just getting a flash, like if you were to go outside, step outside from a, a dark interior and look outside and just kind of close your eyes. And just right. try to reflect on the, all that activity. So I guess I have this internal dialogue when I'm working. It's like, it's about busyness. It's about light. It's about things that are glinting and just disappearing. Like a car drives by and you get a flash off of the right. roof or something and it's gone. And so um, I, I tried to get some of that. The, the, actually, you said the fractured, the fractured nature of like any constancy in our vision. It's just everything's continually moving. We're continually focusing on different things all around the environment. You know, I, I was reading somewhere that we can see, uh, we can focus on something the size of our thumbnail at arm's length at any given time, but we make all these thousands of adjustments and right. focusing every second that we looks like everything is in focus, but it's not, it's really right. not. It's um, really not. Which, which, is really, why, really not. <laughs> which is why those paintings from, from well lit photographs, are utterly unconvincing. Or you say there is a painting that was done from a well lit photograph. Now yeah. a, pain, a painting could be done from a badly lit photograph, and I would probably like it quite a bit better. Yeah, and that's actually preferable. You know, I'll, I'll be taking photos of stuff I might want to do. I, I might see something and be like, you know, I really like this place or something. So I'll take photos of stuff I don't even really consider maybe um, picturesque or what have you. You know what I mean? Just things I might. There might be an interesting pattern of light and dark, so I'll take a picture of that. And if it's blurry or dark or something, my wife will be like, "Don't you want to get a better photo?" I'm like, "No, oh. I want the photo to be, I want the photo to be kind of messed up, you know, yeah. so that there's already you're already one step removed from reality of the photo." So I'll always do a drawing too. Like you said, something very important. You said that as you're, you know, as you're studying, and this is something I think gets lost in the workshop environment that people wanted want an instant fix and they want to learn something in three days and they're going to be great painters or, or great observers of reality or whatever. But it's the work you put in that comes out later that informs the work later. I read this great, great quote by Ben, Ben Sean that said something to the effect, and I don't want to butcher this, but he said a lot of painting is 
done through a feel of intuition, a sense of intuition. He goes, but that's usually led to with a great amount of tuition, of a great amount of study, a great amount of observation, a great amount of drawing from life, painting from life, doing contour line drawings, you know, and then that stuff comes out later. You don't go to a workshop for two or three days, learn some of these things, and then expect to be able to do it. You know, I could go to a workshop on, on, uh, marathon running and for three days I could say it's easy you get up in the morning put your shoes on and you run 26.2 miles it takes a long time to work up to that and, and the things we're talking about here every bit is difficult if not more than doing something like that you know so I I, I, I like that idea of doing a lot of work that has doesn't necessarily have anything to do with anything but then it comes out later in your work you know, right. and, 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 and in this painting, I stole a couple of Cezanne ideas, like the buildings in the background, I pulled them way forward. In the photo, they were so far back, they were insignificant. So I pulled them way forward. I actually tilted down the plane of the street, so it was more like you could see it looking down on it. Uh -huh. um, so it didn't have this kind of convergent punching a hole in the canvas kind of feel. And of course, I put a bunch of clutter there. The people that are there on the right-hand side of the painting in the background, they were much further away. I pulled them forward to kind of make that kind of cozy, patterned wreck of just confusion and light and movement and things like that. So right. I had fun doing that. That was, that was one of those quick paintings just happened, you know? So. Uh -huh. Well, that's, that's next, next slide, Betty Sue. Um, that's one of the, one of the funny things. Jason Sacran will often, often say how you drive him nuts because you'll be like, you know, hanging out and then, you know, hanging out, having a couple of beers, and then go out and do an evening thirty by thirty painting of just because <laughs> you know, you're just you're willing to take these chances. You like you like challenging yourself. You know, you, yeah, you messing up a surface. I mean, you're you're one of the great ones I've seen for when a painting isn't going well. You do a partial wipeout and build off of that rather than uh, yeah. a complete wipeout. And that's been a real inspiration to me. So now this one, this reminds me of like Glacken's or or Cezanne, Cezanne Glacken's Bellows mashup. Talk about yeah. that a little bit. Well, well, this one, this one was on top of another painting, and you can kind of see in the in the lower right where my signature is. There's that blue and that orange, and then up up a hot, little bit higher, there's some of that blue. Um, those, that's all an underpainting. That's a 36 square. I just, I needed something to paint on. And I looked at my wall and I was like, that one's been hanging here a while. I'll paint on that one, you know, cause you don't want stuff piling up and it's like, nothing is, I think we should be challenging ourselves. I think we should be, um, not treating everything as this precious. Cause I get that talk about informing your work that gets into your psyche and you start to be kind of afraid and stiff. Like, Oh, I can't, I can't touch that can't touch that um, I better not do this so I like to I actually revel in that like taking the painting that you know a painting I was hanging here turning it upside down or 90 degrees to one side and just starting to work on it mm -hmm. and I've been calling a lot of those paintings layered space because if you think about the spatial quality of what's underneath and then the spatial quality of what you're putting on top and the malleability of space and the shallowness of the actual physical depth of the picture plane there's a lot of fun that can be had and a lot of, uh, I think, psychological, like emotional power that can be, in the best of cases, can be wrought with that. Right. Um, where it's like a memory or a dream or so you can put somebody in a place. And I just looked at my palette and I was like, there's a lot of, I said, there's a lot of nice shapes on there. <laughs> there's, there's interesting stuff. The tubes kind of stacking back almost reminded me of like old cars piled up in a junkyard or something, you know, like in that green coffee cup on the very end, just the color of it and the way it was sitting there kind of looked like a, almost like a little, a little landscape to me. Oh yeah. Way, you know, I, I, I think so many, so much of what we do, we are, we're, we're like slightly coward, cowardice, slightly cowardly abstract painters. Um, what we're really interested in is the, is the shapes, but we yeah. have this nominal subject matter to get us into that space, we 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 don't quite dare. I mean, if I if I'm trying to do a completely abstract painting, I don't know how to do it because I don't. It seems like all rules are possible. Whereas yeah. if I'm if I'm working off of a reality, whether it's a photographic reality or a 
looking at some uh, my palate. It is it's something to push off of to 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 balance. You know, it's 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 actually giving us water to swim through. Absolutely, uh, and it's here. Yeah, and it and it's more. It's actually more. That's more of what abstraction really is. If you consider the, you know. Yeah. The root word of the word abstract means to draw from. So you're starting with something and you're pulling away or pulling or like an abstract. You read a, a literary abstract of a paper. It's like a small sample that's a small like micro version of the bigger, larger 200 page paper or whatever, you know. So you're 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 starting with something in reality and simplifying it or breaking it down to its essence or even even more simply. Um, right. And so I don't I don't even know if you would call. Even even Robert Motherwell back in the, you know, with the abstract expressionists, they he wrote this a lot of these things saying that this is actually, it isn't pure abstract. It is based on, it is based on the figure. It is based on reality. But they're just so uh, distilled down the images that they're not pure just abstract. Even a Rothko, you know what I mean? You could say there was something initially that was starting as subject matter, and not just mark making for mark making sake on a canvas, you know. So. Um, I, I think that is the root of, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm sure some, there could be many arguments made against this. I don't know, I don't know everything about it, but it's, I think the best abstraction for me starts with something that's in, something that already has some legs on it and you go with it. You right. know, it's, it's interesting. It's, it's fun. It's just more, I think it's more fun and you don't have so many options. When you, when you have to talk about pure abstraction, abstract, just give me a white canvas and all my colors and just making marks. There are too many ways to go, I guess. Right. And you're eventually going to settle down, even if it's just with pure formal elements. Like this is really, there's a lot of vert verticality going on here. I'm going to put some color in here, keep that vertical thing strong. Maybe I'll work with this color and have that. And you've got to focus down on a couple of things to make a design. Right. It can't just be random stuff thrown all over the place. Because you've seen abstract work like that. We both have. And it just, it, it, it seems confused and ununified a lot of the time. Right, right. Because no, from a design well, perspective, yeah. One thing I want I want people watching to to pay attention to here is the, all the tools you are using, and I, by tools I don't mean the literal uh, brushes and and palette knives, but the you are playing with big shapes, you're playing yeah. with chroma, you are playing with edges very very much because you get. Well, a device I see that you use several times is is as you are moving to the focal point, your edges get sharper and sharper. Yeah. They move from being very painterly edges to being very, very thought about. Um, yeah. Like where, where the three, the yellow, orange, and red color passages in the slight upper left, the, the white tubes of paint that are leading us over to that are so... Bam, 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 bam. I mean, it, 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 it's just masterful, your, your, your awareness of the tools you have at hand. Um, hey, hey, I didn't see what Doug's comment was. Love to hear you talk about the power of working within a square for your compositions. Great painting, Patrick. Okay. Um, Thanks, Doug. Thank you, Doug. The next one. They're all, is, is the next one, no, the next one's not square. <laughs> well, that's another common size, but I'll, but I'll talk about the square thing. It's funny. I got a message from a guy on Instagram and he was like, what's with the squares? <laughs> that's first thing he said. He's like, what's with the squares? And I, you know, I'm actually trying to branch out maybe a little bit from that too, because of the fact that a square is already kind of, uh, there's almost too much uh, har harmony and, um, you know, with, with equal sides. So you don't have that kind of dominance of one side. You know, you have like this kind of shared, I don't, even, I don't know what you call it, it's like an equality that's, that doesn't contain dominance. Now, we usually achieve unity in a painting with the dominance of something, either the dominance of color or line or something like that. And so um, that's one of the reasons I like the square. I actually started with squares when I was doing those little no-tan studies, those, those, those kind of improvised ones I told you about before I was doing really uh, looking at the figure, looking at ob ob objects to do paintings out of them. Um, I was like, you know, a square is really challenging. A square is really challenging to break up the space and kind of create this kind of uh, linear dominance. Because you could go either way. You can go horizontal or vertical or even oblique. Uh, 
but to make that work within the square without the opposing uh, sides of the picture giving you any help. You know, if you think of a, it's kind of a funny thought to think of, you know, a very serene beach scene with the sun setting and it's on a really tall vertical. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but you know, it's like, it's kind of silly. It's like, if you're laughing, it's like a, it's like a punchline of a joke. If you were like a comedian in a, in a club with artists, you could say stuff like that, you know? Right. It's like, I'm working on this great painting. It's on a 12 by 24 vertical, you know? Right. <laughs> so. So, so, th so the square kind of offers uh, both of the potentiality for both of those things. You know, it's like it doesn't have either one until you really work with it and look at it and make right. it that way. This really lent itself to having, and this again was something I don't even remember the painting that was underneath, but I found it. I was at home and I had grabbed a couple of canvases that I had paintings that were finished, and I was going to use this one. And I literally just sat at the table. And, you know, the whole thing about this one was the big block of, you know, carry gold butter sitting in the sitting on the plate there. And that was like the only really colorful thing. I mean, there were other things with color, but I wanted that to be all about that color. And I know it is kind of dead center in the canvas, you know, but I thought to me, it just looked right. I know that might break a thousand rules of composition, having that in the center, because I also kind of really put some, uh, emphasis on the salt and pepper shaker as far as like their shape and they're kind of emerging out of this morass and mess of kind of soft like you said soft edges on the left hand side they're kind of like starting to come into focus and then over a little bit the butter is really in focus in the dish and and so um yeah well there, there's so many smart ways you're moving the eye around and this again people Really pay attention. Look, look at look at what look at what this what this Iron City Iron Man is doing here. <laughs> the eye we get led in. We get led in through these discrete objects. I mean that 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 napkin in the foreground to the plate to the uh, to the to the butter, and then the 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 napkin or whatever is behind the salt and pepper shakers. It's yeah. the eye just goes traveling through this painting. And the plane is so beautiful. The drawing is so good in this in this painting. And it's not calling attention to itself. It's not a bravura drawing painting. It's just it's it's a it's a very quietly sneaky painting. You're moving you're moving us around in this just Masterful, masterful. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah. Let's move on to to, to Rockport variation. Um, now, it, 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 this is a square again. This is a twenty four twenty four. Yeah. And one thing I wanted to ask: Do you have? I won at at Forgotten Coast two years ago. Sakran was complaining to me that I wasn't pushing myself. And so I, I love working on squares in the studio. Yeah. And so I brought a bunch of square canvases to Forgotten Coast. I do not think squares are good for painting in plein air. You do need, you do need the prompt of the canvas, or at least yeah. I need the prompt of the canvas. Say, so, okay, you know, because plein air painting, we're not, we're not, is not, at least I don't think it's through to the same degree that I do a studio piece. Plein air painting right. is I'm working on eye hand coordination, you know. So to have a prompt of a one by two aspect ratio or two by one, if we're doing, gonna do your seascapes, um, <laughs> is, is, is incredibly helpful. So now, did this have a genesis in photography or uh, in, in plein air? This kind of had in both, um, but this was obviously done from a photo or pieces of photos. Like 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 the people that are there in the photo I had of the street itself weren't there. So I had to, a lot of this was done from like contour line drawings I had. Um, and you know, for some of the stuff like, like a head with light on it, I might use a completely different reference from something else a drawing i did of the model in the studio you know to see what or a drawing session to see what the light looks like hitting here you know so it's like a it's like a mishmash like a piecemeal of all this stuff that's going on um and i didn't i didn't do it as much on this one but i did try to bring some of the background forward to kind of uh limit that in other words that you're not disappearing back into this um 
this kind of hole that's punched in the canvas that there's a plane there's a flat plane of color that kind of holds you there mm -hmm. and then this and then the sky is just another plane and then you can come back like to the front um i actually this this painting was kind of like the the thing I was really trying to do here, and what I'm trying to do now with a lot of stuff, is use a lot more color. Is is use the use the color as we start to build the space with colorful planes, and use color almost as a you know when I teach drawing, we talk about line, shape, value, texture, edges, and colors kind of left out. You know, every other issue in the elements of designer and design theory can be thought of as drawing issues. You know, if you have bad values, that's a drawing issue. Right. You don't have a correct contour or perspective. Those are drawing issues. Color is the only thing that's kind of left out. But I really, after looking at Hawthorne and people like that and actually building form with color, I want to I wanna try to do more of that and not have things just be like, well, here's a house and its local color is X, so I'm going to paint it that color. Some color that's seen fit for the painting. I'm more interested in having the color almost be independent spatially of anything that's going on in the painting and then superimposing things over that. So it's right. kind of weaving through. And that's why, um, you know, I recently met Frank Webb, who's a great hero of mine in the art, you know, and, and he does that all the time with his paintings. He does, he does these great, uh, there's this spatial stuff and structural stuff going on underneath with color planes. And then he's doing the drawing, incorporating the drawing into that on top. And it's just the most wonderful way. I mean, I just get this giddy kind of excited feeling when, <laughs> when I look at his paintings, I'm like, this is exactly the kind of thing I, I, that gets me excited about making, about seeing a, seeing an image. Right. Is, is the spatial thing going on and, and the imagined kind of otherworldly, this is a, there's a lot of artifice here. It's made on purpose. You know, that's the great thing about seeing a play. And, and actually the new Charlie Kaufman movie of many scenes and it seemed like you're watching a play. Is the, is the total setup of this kind of artificial environment. You know, you, you know, you see the wires for the curtains and everything on the side, but then there's like this table and chairs. It's very artificial. Mm -hmm. That puts you in a mind set of there's some art happening here. Somebody's framing off the world in a square and showing you a piece of reality that was removed from, it was unified with some other thing in reality and you're taking it away and, and making something up. So you have to recreate that reality and unify it in itself as a story, as a piece of art that begins at the edge of one side of the canvas and ends at the other side. You know, that everything happens inside there. Right. And so that's right. kind of what I'm trying to get at. This one maybe didn't achieve that as much, but I, but I like that. Um, it's it's getting somewhere. One of the reasons I threw it in is I think it's getting somewhere. It's starting. I think there's some stuff about it I was excited about. But, right. You know, we'll, we'll see how I can do it. Oh, I, think, I think it's tremendously exciting. Now, Ahota here has a question for you. How much forethought do you give to your color palette, the compliments, before you begin a painting? How much is on the fly? Well, that's actually that that's a good question because um, for the longest time, I'd say for years now, I've been using the same palette which is like two reds, two yellows, and two blues, plus like cadmium orange I used. So for some of these paintings, like I was using like cobalt teal or dioxazine purple, you know, like I, I, I went to get these other, <laughs> phthalo green was a color oh! that was like in there. Yeah, and so. You're like flirting with disaster. That's like, yeah. that's like carrying, <laughs> carrying yeah. the toaster around and dropping it into the swimming pool. <laughs> Anyway, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so what I what I noticed is um, in in the past I would give I would give some thought. I kind of knew how the mixtures would come out because I knew the colors so well on my palette. Um, but since using these other newer colors, I'm like I'm surprised by what's coming out. It's like what if I painted uh, you know this person walking down the street with like quinacridone magenta like you know that's their skin color you know like if you can control the values right you can make that image work and it can be any color i've been really looking at a lot of paintings where they where they really just they're so loose and fast with the color i mean maybe maybe a gradation from like in a portrait from one part of the head here down to here it might be like cadmium green up here and then coming down it's like some kind of like Alizarin or some kind of orange down here. You know what I mean? Like it's it, it's it's transitioning over the form. The color is actually transitioning and doing a gradation over forms. It's like it's 
kind of floating in between and through forms rather than just being local color. Right. So, so I, I don't, I don't consider myself like a, like a really uh, good knowledgeable colorist. Like I basically, to answer AJ's question more, I guess for a lot of color, I do it on the fly. I mean, I try to study it and understand like color gamuts and stuff like that. But if I get too much into that, it gets too controlled and I might want to take, you know, some random color, some color and just pick it up and just smear it on there. Right. Just to see what happens. Just see what happens with it. You know, you get the painting all done and then, because I, cause I think on this painting, yeah, in the, in the back, you can see like in the middle of the upper like left part there, there's that, those pinkish tones and that's like quinacridone, magenta and cad orange mixed together. It certainly has some. There's cadmium. I, there's a definite cadmium feel going on up, up there. Yeah. So. Yeah. So the color is like, I, I think when you step away from local color, it's like, what's that, what's that Van Gogh quote about how the, how the color, the color in a painter's world comes from his palette. It doesn't come from out there. It doesn't come from, you know, pigment comes in tubes, but the color on your painting comes from the painter from his palette. And so there's this kind of otherworldly, and you see that with Van Gogh. You, you see the bright, like in the aural paintings, you know, there's like this bright, everything's yellow and high key and bright, just saturated with color. And it's like, you look at the, you feel like you have to squint when you're looking at those paintings, the bright sunlight, you know? And so when you can, you can kind of get that otherworldly artifice of a dream or a, a thing made on purpose, that design is done on, a thing done on purpose, when you start to approach color or colorlessness for that matter, that way, mm -hmm. you know, like, where you step away kind of whenever I do a painting, there's a lot of local color and I haven't messed with the edges or anything. I just feel like a total hack. Like I feel like, I feel like I morally did something wrong. You know, <laughs> I'll feel bad for the rest of the day because I'm like, God damn, I use local color in a painting. You know, it's like, ah, you know, so. Right. Well, I, you are, you are one of the most rigorous, uh, constantly challenging yourself painters that I know, which is one of the things I really, really respect about you. So before we close, what's what's on your docket of self challenge for uh, the, the months and weeks up, weeks and months and days upcoming? Well, the thing, the thing I'm going to keep doing is, is what I've really been hitting on is like, just, just trying to learn more about design and conceiving of, actuality of space of, of of object space as as design elements as shapes as contours as values and things like that and um building building things based on that trying to see like starting with that saying what if i did this what if i did this what if i use this color so i'm i'm trying to uh um just push myself in that in that direction and hopefully uh something good will come out of it i don't know i don't know it's we're gonna wait and see it might be a wasted year or something or two years or three years i don't know i we'll kind of doubt, doubt it i mean you'll 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 you will end up with a whole bunch of paintings to paint over in any case and that's uh, absolutely that's yes, yes. Of, that's, that's a gift i'm starting to run out of i mean this COVID year of not being out on the road Working in the studio, I'm starting to run out of junker paintings to paint over. Yeah, I'm totally I into it. That's all I want to do is find a painting that I don't like, and uh, you know, in in use it as I'm building an entirely new painting. So yeah, yeah, anyway. absolutely. I, yeah. Go ahead, Charlie. I'm sorry. I just was gonna just kind of wind it up because I mean, okay. I, yeah. I could talk with you. I could talk <laughs> with you for hours. Uh, you know, I feel I, the same way. I could, I could with you too. Forty minutes, and it feels like we've been talking for about two minutes. So I know, I know. Uh, I, so, I, ladies, I, yeah. ladies and gentlemen out there in internet land, you definitely should uh, follow Mr. Patrick Lee. He's on Instagram, and I believe it's Patrick Lee Art. Yeah, at Patrick Lee Art. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, and and I mean, he, you're always thinking about interesting, interesting stuff. So. It's a joy. Let's 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 get one more pithy uh, observation from you uh, before we leave for the day. <laughs> no, I just want to thank you for uh, having me on, Charlie. I, you know, I you know I appreciate you so much as a person and your work. Um, it's just so original, and I thank you for having me on here and just uh, kind of letting me talk about this stuff. Because sometimes just talking about the stuff can help too. If you're with a bunch of like, like when we were, like when we all got together with Doug, you, you know, we all got to sit around and, and shoot, the, shoot the shit about work. You know, it's just yeah. 
Um, it's a good thing. And that's another thing you can carry forward and informs your work. The conversations you have with people, the things somebody might say something, you're like, yeah, you know, I might, I might think about that. So yeah, yeah. that that is so that is so critical. Yeah. So anyway, great to see you, Patrick. Take great to see you. you. And everybody else out there in internet land, you follow us every uh, Tuesday. Um, go and uh, go to my website and buy all my merchandise. I got to start flogging that stuff. Um, and paint well, everybody. Paint well. Challenge yes. yourselves. Avoid that local color, as I, as yes. I said. Avoid that local <laughs> color. Take good care, everybody. Bye-bye. See you guys. Thank you. Thank you.